if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, book of Psalms, Psalm 116. If you're a guest with us, we have been making our way through a, a select uh, series of Psalms. We haven't done all 150, but we've done a number of them over the last few months. And this is the final message in this series of Psalms. It has been a delightful series to walk with the Lord uh, through His Word. And we are looking forward uh, this next Sunday and the entirety of this next month to an Advent series. Uh, Advent, as you know, is the the historical technical word to celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus, which is what we celebrate in the Christmas season. We're going to celebrate that over a series of five messages beginning next week, all about the glory of the identity of Jesus Christ, who he is as Messiah, as God, as man, as Savior, as light of the world. We are are very much looking forward to focusing our gaze on him through a number of passages over the course of the next month. So looking forward to that with you. We are anticipating that and and hoping that God will will illuminate his glory, especially over the course of this Christmas season. Uh, But for this Sunday, let's look at God's word, Psalm 116. This is the word of the Lord, authoritative, powerful, and transforming. Let's read it together. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Not too long ago, I was trying to build a fire in my backyard. I had some old uh, nasty wood fence pickets that I was trying to get rid of, and I couldn't get them to the trash fast enough, and I was too lazy to go to the dump, so I decided to burn them, and I was too impatient to build a proper fire, so I used gasoline. Um, I poured some, <laughs> a little bit, onto the, the wood to expedite the burning process, and, and let me just say, gasoline is a remarkable <laughs> part of this creation. Uh, It is a wonderful thing. Matches, they're great. Gasoline, much better. Uh, Incredible. It was so quickly a bonfire, very contained, very safe, but very quickly a bonfire, and the more I fed it, uh, the more it bonfired. And it was a a wonderful experience watching the fuel feed this fire and the flames consume what I wanted them to consume. 
And I think that this psalm is like gasoline for the soul. It's like fuel. Because all of us have the experience of looking at the flame of our heart, the fireplace of our heart, and saying, it looks more like one of those decorative logs surrounded by a cold hearth with no flames leaping up. All of us, I think, if we believe in the Lord Jesus, would say honestly, I want a heart that is full of grateful devotion to the Lord. I don't know of any Christian who would say, I, I don't want that. I'm looking for cold Christianity. Uh, pure, doctrinal, academic uh, response to God is enough for me. No, every Christian that is a genuine Christian wants a heart that is full of, of grateful devotion and affection for the Lord. Our trouble is not that we don't want that, but we're not always sure how to get that. H how, how do we cause the flame of affection and devotion in our heart to, to well up into a bonfire? How do we move from the cold hearth of nominal Christianity, of technical assent to doctrine, to a heart that is flaming with affection, that loves the Lord, that is grateful to him. Well, this psalm provides fuel for the flame of our devotion. This psalmist would say that it is in reviewing the mercy of God that we fuel the flame of our devotion to God. He would say the miracle of mercy produces a heart of grateful devotion to God. The miracle of mercy produces, it reveals, it motivates grateful devotion to the Lord. So if you want to be gratefully devoted to the Lord, the way to do it is to review the miracle of God's mercy. That's what he does. The psalm basically divides into two sections. The first, uh, you notice there, 11 verses are essentially a story of rescue. A story of rescue. So that'll be my first point. And then he transitions to a response of grateful devotion. So there's first a story and then a response. All right, let's look at point one, a story of mercy. He starts in verse one and two, if you look down at your Bibles, with a, a summary of where he's going to go in the rest of the psalm. A lot of psalms do this. You'll notice this in the psalms. They have an opening kind of summarizing verse, and then they walk through that theme over the rest of the verses. So you notice he says right from the outset, I love the Lord. So for this psalmist, his flame is burning brightly. I love the Lord, he says. But then he gives the reason. Because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. And then he reverses it in a wonderful parallelism. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. We want to appreciate the poetry that's present in the Psalms. They don't use rhymes and rhythms like we do in English. But if we, if we begin to pay attention, we can notice the beauty of this, this reverse parallel. Did you see that? He starts by saying, I love the Lord because he heard me. Then he says, because he heard me, then I will call on him as long as I live. You notice that he, he's saying in as beautiful a terminology as he can, look, I have this great affection for God. I have a permanent trust in him. That's what call on him means. I will trust him forever. Why? Because he heard me. This is his testimony. This is his theme. And we have to shed some of the entitled view of God that our culture has and get back into the world of the psalmist where a deity is under no obligation to listen to the prayers prayed to him. In our culture, we tend to assume with the French philosopher that, that it, is, it is God's obligation to listen to prayer. But, but this psalmist has, has no delusion. He doesn't think it's God's obligation to listen to prayer at all. He doesn't think that God has any, has any need to listen to this little speck on the midst of this little speck called earth. He doesn't sense that there's any obligation of God to have heard his request for mercy. Charles Spurgeon said this, There was no right on the sinner's part to the kind consideration of the Most High. Had the rebel been doomed at once to eternal fire, he would have richly merited the doom. And if delivered from wrath, sovereign love alone has found a cause, for there was none in the sinner himself. 
Look, we must shed the entitled pride of our culture that presumes that God owes us a listening ear and remember that in the billions of galaxies and stars that God watches continually, there exists a tiny speck called Earth. And on that Earth, there exists even smaller sinners who do not warrant any special attention from the ruler of the universe. We must enter into the psalmist's more appropriate surprise and hear his gratefulness as he declares, The Lord heard my voice. He inclined his ear to me. If we want to be affectionate towards God, we have to first shed our sense that God owes us a listening ear. The more we assume God is obligated toward us, the less affectionate we will be towards him. He begins by declaring, I love the Lord because he heard my plead for mercy. Then he gets more specific in verses 3 and 4. Here's his situation. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. This is his condition. He pictures death almost as a person who has laid a trap for him and has caught him in the snare. You might picture some of those kind of gruesome uh, scenes perhaps you've seen where someone steps into a bear trap out in the woods and, and they are snared and the pain and pang and possible death that awaits this person that's been caught. He says, look, I'm, I'm as one that the grave has its claws in me and is dragging me down. I suffer the pain and anguish knowing that this is my future that death is all that awaits me. That was my condition. I had no hope in myself. I was only experiencing the suffering of knowing that Sheol, the place of the dead, has opened his mouth to receive me. And in that place of utter hopelessness, what happened? I called on the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord represents his character and his covenant disposition to save. And he prays, O oh Lord, deliver my soul. So out of this place of, of snared anguish, as he is literally being dragged to the grave, he cries out, Lord, deliver my soul. And then in a wonderful storytelling technique, he pauses before he provides what happens and just describes the one he's calling to. Gracious is the Lord. Grace being God's favor to those who are undeserving. And righteous doesn't just mean morally pure. It means that he is faithful to his promises. He is righteous, he says in verse 5. Our God is merciful. That means he reaches out to those who have no other hope but him. The Lord preserves who? Again, notice the surprise of the psalmist. He preserves not just the strong, not just the wise, not just the impressive. He preserves the simple. Simple meaning those who have no claim to any prestigious or impressive apparatus of strength. They're just simple. They're just simple people that are being clawed down to the grave. They have no nobility in themselves, no greatness in themselves. He preserves. Who does he preserve? The simple this God preserves. He doesn't just pay attention to the impressive, to those who perhaps could be a feather in his cap. No, he pays attention to those who have no claim of being impressive at all. And here he answers. When I was brought low, down to the very grave, I was brought low in verse 6. What happened? He saved me. He saved me. The result is, in verse 7, he can exhort his soul, Return, O my soul, to your rest. Return from this place of anguish and hopelessness and lostness and pain and the sense of the grave clawing you down into its depths, the sense of being worthless in your ability to rescue yourself. Instead, you can be at rest. Why? The end of verse 7. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Why can he be at rest? The Lord has dealt bountifully. What is the definition of that bounty? Look at verse 8. You have delivered my soul from death. This is the psalmist declaring his story of mercy. Here's my story, he says. He delivered me from death. I had nothing in my future but the yawning mouth of the, of the enemy death 
reaching out for me and looking to devour me and bring me down into its depths. And yet God snatched me out from that jaw. He delivered my soul from death. And he continues building on that theme with a different angle. He delivered my eyes from tears. The tears of my own demise have been wiped from my eyes. I no longer need to cry over the hopelessness of my condition. He delivered my feet from stumbling. Again, the picture here of a, of a great yawning pit open before his soul that he would on his own stumble into. And yet God lifted him out of that place and kept him from falling in. He did all these things. And instead, verse 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And just to remember again how desperate he was, he said, I believed, in other words, I believed in the Lord even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. This was his condition. He said, I am, I am greatly afflicted. I have no hope. Death is my only outcome. And so I looked to the Lord in the midst of my affliction. He says in verse 11, I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What's he saying? He's saying, look, this was my situation. I looked around. I saw no hope in the promises of men. I saw no hope in my affliction. The only hope I had was to believe in the Lord that he could rescue me. This is his story. This is his testimony. He's written it in graphic terminology. Now, now certainly, this psalm could apply and could be about a, a very practical, physical deliverance. Certainly, that could be the case. Perhaps the psalmist literally, physically, was surrounded by lying enemies. Perhaps he was quite literally under a sentence of death, and somehow God delivered him. But, but I don't think we can read this without seeing the ultimate display of this same mercy in our own soul's salvation. Uh, certainly, this is a good psalm uh, for anybody who's rescued from a, a physical demise in a temporary way. But it's an even better psalm for a celebration of how God has delivered us from the very curse of death that this psalmist describes so well. Every person faces this same situation because of their sin. Death yawns in front of them, a great mouth looking to devour and drag into its depths those who are far from God. There is the pang of knowing that this life is short and after it comes the judgment. There is the certainty of knowing that mankind has no hope and can only offer false promises of deliverance. There is the sense that the only future we could know is that death and an eternal death awaits each individual sinner. And that God is under no obligation to hear our cry as we fall into the pit. Picture, if you would, for a moment, a person who has lived their life ignoring God. And then in that final moment, as they are gasping out their last breaths, they, they realize that they have neglected God for all of their days. And as they, they fall, their soul literally falls into the pit of endless death. They call out to the Lord. Do you realize God is under no obligation to answer? And that is the experience of every human being, that they are moments away, years away. What's the difference in the long scheme? They are moments away from falling into this same situation that this psalmist is in. Do you realize this is you? This is me. Because of sin, because the wages of sin is death, and death always pays its wages. You cannot refuse the wages of sin. They will be paid. They will certainly be paid. They will unstoppably be paid. They will irrevocably be paid. And the person who has sinned is receiving that wage of death as they take their final breath and are plunged into this situation of having no hope, only the, the anguish and the pain of the, the grip of death drags them down forever. Look, this is the situation of every human being. And for every Christian, they can lay claim to this psalmist's story. What happened in that moment? What took place? What happened? 
there was somehow, miraculously, a, a sight of someone who could deliver, of the one person who could rescue. Somehow, the promises of God came to mind. We know that's because of God's grace towards us in that moment that we were thinking of him. And in his illumination, he reveals his mercy and allows us to call out to him. And in calling out to him, what happens? Shockingly, he answers. He answers and rescues us and delivers us so that we can say with the psalmist, return to your rest. No longer fear the pangs of death. No longer have any fear of the tears of your final judgment flowing forever. No longer have any fear of stumbling into God's judgment. Why? Because the Lord is merciful and righteous. He preserves the simple. And when I was brought low, he saved me. Now, the irony of this psalm is the means of God's salvation is that God the Son took on the reality of this psalm without being delivered from death so that we could experience the promise of this psalm in being delivered from death. Do you understand what I'm saying in that? If you read this psalm as a song that Jesus prayed, you can see the, the, the shocking lack of answer as he went to the cross. Jesus also loved the Lord. Jesus also prayed to be removed from the pangs of death. And yet he declared, not my will, but your will be done. He went to the cross. He went to the grave. And in that death, we are delivered from the pangs of death. The mercy of God was not this uh, kind of distant deity that plucked someone out of some physical danger. No, the, the mercy of God was in sending himself to experience that punishment rightfully deserved so that thousands and millions in, of, of Christians over the centuries could not experience that same punishment and could be lifted and rescued out of it. Listen, Christian. Let's pour some fuel over the flame of our affection. Can you say right now, He saved me. He saved me. Listen, you did not save yourself. No person falling can save themselves. There's no handhold. There's no foothold. There's just empty space yawning in front of a sinner with nothing to grasp but air and nothing to do but fall endlessly into God's judgment. He snatched me, rescued me, lifted me. How? By going himself into the pit. Listen, he saved me. He saved you. He rescued you. This is your story if you're a Christian. You are not a Christian because you're impressive. You're not a Christian because you had some handhold that others don't have. You're not a Christian because you climbed out of the difficulty of your life. You're not a Christian because you have more endurance than the person next door. You're a Christian because he saved you. He rescued you. He lifted you. When this was your only future, darkness and damnation, he rescued you. This is your story. This is more your story than anything else that's true about you. This is more your story than your work credentials, than your academic background. This is more your story than how effective a parent you are. This is more your story than how wealthy you are. This is more your story than how good you are with fixing your car. This is more your story than anything that's humanly impressive about you. You know what's most impressive about you? He saved you. He rescued you. This was your condition. This was my condition. And the mercy of God rescued you out of the mouth of the curse of death. He rescued you. This is your story. This is my story. This is the fuel that must be poured over the flame of our heart. And what's the result of meditating on this story? Well, the response will be clear as he continues. It's grateful devotion to the Lord. But, but brothers and sisters, we must actually meditate. We must actually pour this fuel over our hearts if we want the flame of our affection and devotion to grow. 
It, it is not a mystery why we sense a coldness or lack of devotion in our heart towards the Lord. It is because the flame of this meditation is so rarely poured over the fire of our hearts. Let me ask you a a self-examination question in light of this psalm. Does this story form a regular part of your private meditation? Evaluate the last week, the last month, the last year. Does this story, does, does this description form a regular part of your private meditation, of your private study? Now, is it good to study our calling to obey the Lord? Is it good to study uh, strange and unusual doctrines so that we can debate online? Is, is it good to study uh, the, the, the politics of our age and what's, what's happening in the world? Well, sure, we, we might study those things, but, but is our heart studying the story of our redemption? Is it studying it? Is it thinking about it? There's no mystery here. Are, are we thinking about and reading about and meditating on our story of redemption so that we could write a, a similar story in our own words that reflects what this psalmist is saying? What is this psalm? It, it's just his own personal reflections put to verse and inspired by God to fuel our own reflections. Are, are we meditating on the fact that Jesus suffered this death so that we could be delivered from this death? Are we meditating on the cost that he felt so that we could experience the grace and mercy and covenant faithfulness of our God? Are we meditating on the fact that, as Paul says in Corinthians, who sees anything impressive in you? That's what this psalmist is saying. The Lord preserves the simple He's saying, it's, it's remarkable that a God who owns galaxies cares about me. It's, it's incredible mercy that is displayed here, but we must meditate on it. Let me encourage you, church. Take time in your life to meditate on the story of your redemption. What I mean by that is meditate on those passages that reveal to you the surprise of God's mercy that reveal the desperateness of your condition before Christ and the glory of your condition after Christ. Get your soul wrapped into those kinds of verses. And if you read them and it has no effect on you, it could be a sign that it's been a long time and the entitled view of our pride has, has shielded your eyes from the glory of it. You're going to have to spend some more time and pour some more fuel. Get, get in touch with the surprise of God's mercy again. Sometimes I, I worry about what we might call the conservative uh, Christian ethos that often is present in evangelical church where we can sometimes talk a lot about our moral superiority compared to the culture. And comparatively, we talk less about the shock that God rescued us. Now, are we supposed to be morally superior for those who hate God? Well, yes, of course, we are. But the reason we are is because we are amazed that God rescued us. Fathers, are we meditating on the shock of God's rescue with our children? Or are we spending most of our parenting teaching them how to behave? It is our responsibility to, to pour the fuel of the surprising story of God's mercy over the flame of our hearts. And the result of that will be a response of grateful devotion. Let's look at his response beginning in verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord, he says, for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. This opening question is, in a sense, it's a rhetorical question because it has no answer. <laughs> Obviously, there's nothing that we can give back to God or contribute to God as a return on our salvation. But a rhetorical question has the effect of motivating us. I, I think he answers his own question by saying, what, what can I do in returning to God 
the benefits of the salvation he has given to me. Here's what I will do. I will lift up the cup of salvation. Now, the rest of these verses, probably, it pictures a moment in the temple. When this, this man has, has come near to the place of God's dwelling in the Old Testament, and he is offering thanksgiving in terms of that situation in that physical temple. So to lift up the cup of salvation probably is a reference to pouring out a drink offering and a declaration that God has delivered me. When he talks about declaring he will fulfill his vows, it seems as though this psalm is in itself perhaps the fulfillment of that vow, that it's a, it's a way of standing before the congregation of God's people and declaring that he has been delivered. So the, the point of this response is it is at once nothing and everything. <laughs> it's nothing because it does nothing to contribute to God or to pay him back. It, in that sense, it's nothing. What can I do? Well, one answer is nothing. I, I can't pay God back for my salvation. I can't contribute to the God who owns everything. God, God didn't save me because he, he didn't see me as an investment uh, that he was hoping for some big return. It's not like he said, well, this is going to be good. Uh, we'll send Christ to save this individual. That's our investment, and the return's going to be impressive. No, there, there's no logic in that. You don't spend a fortune to get nothing back. So in the one sense, our response is nothing. In another sense, it is everything. It is everything that we are, duty-bound to declare to the Lord the greatness of his salvation. What shall I do? Well, here's what I'll do. Nothing and everything. I'll lift up the cup of salvation, and I will call on the name of the Lord. In other words, my response for his salvation is that I will never stop trusting his salvation. What else is my response? I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. He actually says this twice, there and again. He repeats it in verse 18. So th this man viewed uh, his life as being bound by an oath to offer thankful devotion to the Lord. He considered this deliverance to come with a duty-bound oath of responsiveness and gratefulness to God. He did not consider his salvation to be a one-time event that then led to a lifetime of forgetfulness. He considered his salvation to come with a calling, a responsibility of permanent devoted gratefulness, e even a legal sense of obligation to the Lord. He reminds himself again in verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I don't, I don't think that means that the Lord loves it when his people die. That would make no sense. I, I think what it's saying there is the Lord takes a personal care over the well-being of his people. He considers this danger of them facing death a, a, an object of his personal attention. He's going to take personal care over any risk of the death of his saints. It's precious to him because they are precious to him. O Lord, he says, I am your servant. Lest we think of this only, or we be tempted to think of this as only this momentary fulfillment of a vow, as in he's going to respond to God's salvation by taking a moment in the temple and saying, thank you, Lord, and then turn away and forget it. No, he makes it very clear. This is all of life devotion. I am your servant. He repeats it. I am your servant. And then he adds this phrase that we don't understand, the son of your maidservant. But to put it in our language, what that's meaning is, I am a servant that will never leave your house. That's what it means. I'm, I'm the son of your maidservant. It means I, I don't go free from you. I stay with you. No matter what else happens, no matter whoever else goes out of your house, I, I, I am in your house forever. I'm one of those servants that gets marked as belonging to you forever. And then he repeats, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. He pictures his life as being this perpetual offering of grateful devotion. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. 
Now, how, how do we take all this legal language, vowing and offering of sacrifice and, and thanksgiving and in the courts of the Lord and being kind of a permanent devoted fixture in the temple? What, what, are we, what are we to take this language in terms of ourselves? We don't typically have vows and this kind of sacrificial language. How, how are we to apply that to ourselves? Well, I think we can forget that our salvation purchased us for the Lord. Sometimes we can think of grace as this thing that was given to us and that we carry in our pocket as we pursue our otherwise normal life. Do you ever think of grace that way? It's, it's, a, it's a credential that secures me heaven, but I, I otherwise pursue a relatively normal life a relatively normal use of media, a relatively normal interaction with my neighbors, a relatively normal family life, a, a relatively normal priorities and privileges, a, a relatively normal establishment of a lifestyle here. I, I kind of have this credential, but I, but I live my life relatively normally. And, and yet the New Testament makes it very clear, this kind of, of calling and, and permanent covenant is what it means to be a Christian. Christ rescued us from sin and purchased us for himself. We, we were not just rescued from the, the, the condemnation and the wrath of God. We were brought into a life of permanent grateful devotion. It, it's not a grudging obligation. It's glad and willing service, but it is a devotion, a covenant, a vow. You could almost describe the, the claim of Christ as both a, a, a trusting in him for salvation and a permanent vow to serve him as Lord. Those cannot be separated. Christ isn't only Savior and not Lord. He is the Savior King. And so when we come to him for deliverance from God's judgment, we also come to him in our willing response and servanthood that is this grateful devotion to him and that we also will declare, in your presence I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I am your servant to the end of my days and I will lift up my voice and declare the Lord has saved me. This is his Response, And I, it really is our calling as well. It really is. It is your calling and my calling. Consider just for a moment, if you would, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Or First Peter. Peter says, If you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Or as Paul says again in Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. There's many other verses we could reference it. But I just want to point out the logic here. The logic is, when God saved us, he didn't just save us from, he saved us to. He didn't just rescue us out of our destruction, he rescued us into a permanent relationship with him. When we come to Christ, when we declare that this is our story, that I was sinking into the grave that I rightly deserved because of my sin, and Christ rescued me by his own death in my place on the cross, he bound me to him forever. And that is the only safe place. Listen, that there is no salvation where Christ rescued us and keeps us at a distance. That actually is not a salvation at all because our whole need is to be in Christ. Outside of Christ is condemnation. Inside of Christ is safety. 
And so when God rescued us in Christ, he brought us into this place of permanent, bonded, eternal union with him. And listen, in that situation, our calling is clear. We are to lift up the cup of salvation. We are to declare in a, in a duty-bound, grateful devotion to the Lord that he has saved us. We are to lift up our voice and shout and proclaim his praise. We are to declare that we belong to him permanently and forever. We are to acknowledge his salvation for us as our standard of life. The miracle of God's mercy always produces a lifestyle of grateful devotion to him. A lifestyle. I love that word lifestyle. It just gets into the nitty-gritty of our everyday life. A lifestyle. It's not, a, it's not an occasional scheduled event. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of life. And, and what is our way of life? Well, it's the most glorious thing we can imagine. What, what is essentially the calling of the Christian? It's to live in such a way that we are declaring, I belong to God and I am declaring his salvation in mercy over me. God's mercy results in a grateful devotion as our lifestyle. You see the logic in this psalm. It's the same logic Paul uses. Since you were purchased, you belong to him. Since you were ransomed, you should live in this way. I appeal to you by the mercies of God, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Listen, the kind of grateful devotion we see from this psalmist should describe our disposition towards the Lord. It should do that all the time. And I think in the context of this psalm, we could also say it should especially be the case when we are in the presence of God's people. There's not a time in our life when we shouldn't be the, the claimed and purchased servant of the Lord, but especially, this psalmist is especially concerned that when he gathers around the saints of God, they will hear his voice declaring, the Lord has saved me. Listen, when we gather here on Sunday, we need to ensure that the people of God hear our voice declaring, the Lord has saved me. He has rescued me. He reached out and grasped me from the, the descent into hell, and he lifted me up in security with Christ. He has rescued me. This should be our, our testimony to one another. We should be eagerly declaring, you know, the Lord has rescued me. You know those, those Christians who I think you can tell that they spend a lot of time fueling this flame in their heart? It's those folks that when you hear them talk about salvation, tears come to their eyes, a quiver comes to their voice, and they just can't help declaring, I'm amazed at the grace of God. They just want to tell you about it. Brothers and sisters, when we gather, what are we doing when we gather? We are not assenting to mental doctrines. We are declaring a personal salvation. A very practical application. When we're singing songs about the glory of God's salvation, sing with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because you are fulfilling the calling to which God rescued you. Lift up the cup of salvation and declare, because Jesus took the cup of wrath in my place, I have only to lift up the cup of salvation. Because Jesus experienced the pangs of death in my place, I was lifted out of death and brought to walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Because the Lord delivered my soul, I will declare that he is my deliverer. Look, Jesus did not die to create a mute people. God did not intend to rescue a disinterested congregation. He did not redeem an assenting but not acclaiming choir. He rescued us so that our lips would declare his redemption. This is our calling, brothers and sisters. And what a calling it is. 
so that your voice and your heart flame up with a declaration, the Lord saved my soul. Lord, I will pay to you what you have claimed me for. And here's all that it is. To declare with grateful devotion that I belong to you because of your redemption and that you have rescued my soul. For all my days, as long as I have breath, I will declare, I belong to the one redeemer of mankind, Jesus Christ, the one who suffered death in my place, who lifted me from the grave, who raised me with him in Christ and positioned me for every heavenly blessing in the heavenly places. This is our story. This is your story. And this is your response. This is the response that you are called to. Men, women, teenagers, children, this is the response that you are called to. If you are not called to this, you are still falling into the grave. And if you're here and you feel no flame of affection towards Jesus and you can't understand why people are excited about his deliverance, then you need God to open your eyes to see that though you seem fine, you are descending into the grave of God's judgment for your sin. It may happen tomorrow. It may happen the next day. Death is only a breath away. And you need God to rescue you so that you can sing this song with us. Please, if you are here and you do not know Jesus as your Savior and you know about him, but you don't know him the way this psalmist does, please turn to him, acknowledge you are a sinner, and you can join this song. Not because you have to, or because dad and mom did, but because it's true of you. And if you're a Christian, let us sing this song with all of our heart, especially when we gather, and certainly when we scatter, declaring, the Lord has saved me. Let us lift up the cup of salvation. Let us declare that we are your servants. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would pour over our hearts illumination reveal to us Lord the miracle of your salvation you saved us Lord give us the song of redemption let it flow willingly out of our hearts Let us exult in your mercy, the miracle of it. Let us proclaim it back to you. In your name we pray and we sing.